Colossians chapter 4. The book of Colossians chapter 4. We are in the midst of a series on the essentials of our faith. What are those necessary, basic elements that are indispensable to our walk with God? And we've been looking at these uh, things throughout the New Testament letters. And, and most of these thoughts come at the end of these New Testament letters because it's the very last things that these writers want to impress upon their, their audience, their readers, the recipients of these letters, before, obviously, they, they, don't, they run out of the, the time. So they, they want to leave them with these thoughts. And so that's why most of these passages occur at the end of these Letters. Now today, uh, we're going to be looking at a passage that may uh, have lots of different stuff in it, and, and it does. But I want to sort of center, if you will, everything around the subject of devotion. Because that's what we're going to be talking about primarily, and that's what we're going to end up with today, is talking about what it means to be a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. The goal here at the Oasis is to build a growing group of devoted followers to Jesus Christ. And I think today we're going to even see from this passage how imperative it is, how necessary it is that we become and remain devoted followers to Jesus Christ. Well, the first six verses of Colossians chapter 4 really tell us that we need to be devoted followers of Jesus Christ because the world desperately needs to see Jesus in us. Then from verse 7 through the end of the chapter, he's basically saying, and another reason we need to be devoted followers is because our brothers and sisters in Christ need to see Jesus in us as well. So sort of two groups are laid out here for us. I want to begin, though, in chapter 4 at verse 2. He says, be devoted to prayer. Turn to God in prayer and do it in a devoted way. Now again, we're going to come back to that because that's primarily what we want to talk about today, but I want to move on. I want to sort of uh, rather uh, swiftly move through this passage and then show you how we can come back to the idea of devotion and how you will see that devotion really is all the way through this passage. And one of the reasons you and I need to be devoted to turning to God in prayer is because it will allow us to stay alert. Notice he combines those two, keeping alert in it. That means to stay awake spiritually, to stay, to stay vigilant, to stay watchful. In fact, Jesus even combines these concepts when he told his own followers, watch and pray. Same concept, that one of the ways you and I, as disciples of Jesus Christ, stay alert, stay aware of what's going on in us and around us, and stay watchful and vigilant spiritually, is through our prayer time, through our time with God in prayer. And then, obviously, part of our prayer life should always be thanksgiving, expressing gratitude to God and being very conscious, conscious of his grace. Then notice what he says. At the same time, Paul says, turn to God for us too, that God may open a door for the message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. I just want to make this comment. Don't get, uh, don't get too hung up with the word mystery and allow it to be mysterious to you. All the word mystery in the New Testament means it is something that would be unknown to us unless God revealed it. That's what a mystery is. So it sort of takes the mystery out of it, if you will. Uh, that's why much of the New Testament, if you will, unlocks mysteries that were presented for the first time in the Old Testament. They were things, concepts that God had mentioned in the Old Testament, but had not fully revealed until the coming of Christ or until the New Testament age. And that we would not even know about these things, again, unless God chose to reveal it. To us. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 4. He says, pray that I may make this message known as I should. Paul was so concerned 
that when God gave him opportunity to be a witness, to testify to others about Christ, to be an evangelist, that he would do so clearly and effectively because his, his mind, his heart, uh, his, his desire, his passion was for others to see Jesus in him and for others to come to faith in Christ. And so notice this is all also born around how important prayer is because one of the things in a sense that Paul's talking about here as far as praying for us and pray for this and, and we need to be involved with prayer is that when you and I spend time in prayer that God shapes our heart to be sensitive and concerned and willing to go out into the world and be a witness for Christ to others and then to do so in a very effective way. There's ways that we as Christians can move out into the world and sort of repulse people from Christ and from our faith. And there are ways that we can move throughout those that don't know Christ and actually be attractive to where they're actually uh, sort of interested in our faith and, and what we have to say. And that's why prayer is so important. It prepares us to be used by God in a way that can positively impact and influence other people's lives. That's why in verse 5, notice what he says, conduct yourselves. The word conduct just means walk. In other words, Paul's reducing even our life to a, to a walk and saying every step that we take, especially out there in the world where there are people that don't know Christ and have a relationship with him and we're interacting with them and they're watching us, notice what Paul says, take every step of your life, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, those who are without Christ. This word wisdom is a word that reminds us just simply not to go through life carelessly, to make sure that we are uh, approaching especially opportunities that we have to interact with those that don't know Christ with forethought and with tact, never carelessly. And then he says, making the most of the opportunities. Seizing, as Christians, those moments of interaction that you and I get with those that don't know Christ. And those that need to see Christ in us. And that's why Paul's saying we need to be devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Because those without Christ need to see that there's a distinction. There's a difference between our lives and their lives. And in such a positive way that they want to know what makes us tick. And why we are the way we are. And that we live in such a way that, like I said, instead of pushing them away, that actually they, they want to know more. Paul says that's the kind of life we as believers need to live. This is why we need to be devoted. This is why we need to be devoted to prayer and spending time in prayer and praying for other Christians who are interacting with people in the world on a daily basis. Because we need to make the most of those opportunities that God gives us. And that's why then he says, you know, one of the things that can either repel or repulse people or bring them more to, to want to know more about Christ is what we say. It's our tongue. It's our mouth. And the Bible talks a lot about how, you know, we'd be okay a lot of times if it wasn't for what came out of our mouth. So that's why in verse 6, he spends a lot of time with our words and what we say. And again, in the context, he's not just talking about what we're saying around other Christians. Here he's talking about how we talk around unbelievers. And notice what he says. Let your speech always, always, in each and every situation, be gracious. A couple things implied in the word gracious. First of all, it means to reach out. In other words, God is encouraging us at times to take the initiative, especially with those that don't know Christ. If they're not going to talk to us, at least let's be friendly and smile and at least say hi or, or try to, to, to engage in some way conversation with them. So it's talking about reaching out. It's reminding us even about the character of God who loved us before we loved him. You see, God always took the initiative in his relationship with us, and he's telling us that with non-believers, be willing to take the initiative. Be willing to reach out with your words. But there's another thing implied with the word gracious, and that means pleasant and kind. Always be reaching out with our speech in a pleasant and kind way 
especially towards outsiders. Then notice what he says. I love this. Seasoned with salt. Let your speech be seasoned with salt. It's the concept of let our speech be something that's tasteful, something that's flavorful, something that's going to create a thirst within those who hear our speech. That's what it means to let your speech be seasoned with salt. Again, the way we talk and how we talk to others, uh, or even if someone is listening in, it can be the kind of speech that's like, oh man, I, I don't want to get to know them any better. Or I, you know, they, they might say that they know God in a personal way, but wow, listen to them. You know, God says, be careful here. And, and in order to, to be in this place all the time, to be this alert and watchful and vigilant about these interactions that we have with those that don't know Christ, Paul is saying we've got to be devoted to prayer. We've got to spend time with God so that we can be made right and our hearts can be made right and God can, can rule over our mouth and then so that we can be sensitive to those around us and even sensitive to other believers who we know every day are interacting with other non-believers and to be praying for them too. And then he says, so that you may know how you should answer everyone. How should we respond and reply in conversation? And notice here throughout this entire passage, on the reason that we need to be devoted is because other people desperately need to see Jesus in us, especially here in this context, those who don't have a relationship with God. Paul's overarching theme is to live in such a way that it is appealing, if you will, to those that don't know God. It is favorable. In other words, we're giving a very appealing and favorable impression of who we are in Christ to those that don't know Christ. So that again, they'll want to know more about what we have that they don't have. And so Paul is calling us out here. He's saying we need to be devoted followers of Jesus Christ so that we can make a positive impact on the world in which we live. A world that desperately needs Jesus. And then, beginning in verse 7, he then starts to talk about all the relationships that we have with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And how we're not only going to positively influence and impact, hopefully, those that don't have God in their life, but God also puts us in a body to interact continuously with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ so that we can be a positive impact on one another as well. So notice he starts to talk about all these brothers and sisters in his own life. He says, Tychicus, a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow slave of the Lord. And by the way, those words fellow slave describe a devoted follower. Someone who's really committed. Paul's not going to call every Christian a fellow slave. But he calls Tychicus a fellow slave because he sees his devotion. He says, he will tell you all the news about me. I sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are, how we are doing and that he may encourage your hearts. I sent him with Onesimus, the faithful and, and dear brother who is one of you. And they will tell you about everything here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, and I can only imagine, anybody that was named Jesus back then, probably went, I'm, I'm changing my name. That's just too big of a name to carry around, you know. Yeah, I'm Jesus. No, I'm not really Jesus. I'm Justice. So he went by Justice, who also sends greetings. In terms of Jewish converts, these are the only fellow workers in the kingdom of God. And they have been a comfort, a refreshment to me. Now, I want to zero in on this Epaphras guy. He's special. And, and Paul gives a little bit more detail about him. And notice, too, again, it's in the context of prayer. We're going to be starting a 16-week series on prayer in just a couple of weeks. And right even here in this passage, 
God is already sort of preparing us for, for how we need to start making prayer more of a priority in our lives. And we're challenged by these examples here in Colossians chapter 4. Notice what it says about Epaphras. He is always struggling in prayer on your behalf. Struggling in prayer. Can I say, this is going to tie into devotion. Because one is not going to be willing to struggle in prayer or struggle in anything if one is not devoted to it, you see. By the way, very interestingly, this word for struggle in the original language is where we get our English word for agonize. Think about what Paul's saying. This guy is willing to agonize in prayer, not for himself, but for you all. He is wanting you to see Jesus in him, and he wants to so be a positive influence and impact on your life that he is willing to enter the arena of prayer and face the enemy continuously, which is the other concept here with the word struggle. It, it was a word that was used for, for sort of one-on-one -on -one combat, say, as gladiators would meet in the arena. And Paul's saying, this guy, Epaphras, he was willing to walk into that arena every day and face the enemy. Why is he using that in, in the concept of prayer? Because Paul's reminding us of something. That every time you and I try to pray or attempt to pray or start to make prayer more of a priority in our life, we're going to have resistance from our spiritual enemy. He's going to put up obstacles and everything to try to get us not to pray because the enemy, maybe even more than we, knows the power of prayer. And he will do everything he can to stop Christians from praying. So unless Christians are truly devoted to prayer, as Paul talked about in Colossians 4.2, we won't pray very much. Because every time we start to pray and try to pray and continue to pray and make prayer a priority, just like the other spiritual disciplines in our life, we're going to get pushed back. It's not going to be this easy thing that we do. We're going to have to be willing to enter that arena and struggle and agonize through it and get some grit to our Christian life and get some persistence and tenacity so that when the enemy pushes back, we in the power of Christ push back too. And don't let the pushback, those winds of adversity, just shut us down like many Christians do. Who give in and give up too easily. This is where devotion comes in. And then notice what he's praying for. Many times in our modern Christianity, the only requests that we pray for one another for are physical things. And I'm not saying that's wrong. We are supposed to pray for each other's physical ailments and illnesses and health and all that. But if you read the prayers of the New Testament, you will see way more prayers for the spiritual growth and maturity of other believers by other believers than you ever do the physical things in their life. And the same thing is true here in Colossians 4 too. How many of us, as brothers and sisters in Christ are praying for a few brothers and sisters for their spiritual growth and maturity on a regular, continual basis. Epaphras does. Notice what Paul says about him. He prays continually and struggles in prayer on your behalf so that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. The words stand mature speak about a a stability, a, a calm composure, if you will. One, one who's not going to flake. One who has a, a maturity, if you will, about them. And Epaphras is constantly praying for these Christians in Colossae, that they would grow up and mature and become these firm, steadfast, stable, devoted believers. And then he goes on to say, who are fully convinced in all the will of God. A couple of things here. It not only means to be confident and convinced in what the will of God is for my life, but even more importantly, be willing to follow God's best for my life. Because it's one thing to know God's will, it's another thing to follow God's will. And many Christians can say, well, I know what God wants me to do, but I'm just not at a point where I'm willing to surrender and do it. So the volitional aspect here is also implied when he says, 
He prays for you guys. And he's always praying that you will find God's will for your life and that you'll be willing to follow God's will for your life. This is what Epaphras struggles in prayer for those Colossian Christians. That's devotion, folks. That's the kind of devotion we need to see today in the body of Christ. Because those without Christ need to see Jesus in us, and those who already have Christ need to see Jesus in us as well. For Paul goes on, I can testify that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the physician, and Demas greet you. I want to stop there for a moment. I don't think that this is by accident that Paul mentions Demas here. Because let's remember how Demas ended. Demas was at one time a member of Paul's missionary team. A faithful, devoted follower of Jesus Christ. But guess what? He didn't stay that way. He didn't finish well. Because the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul says, Demas has deserted me. He has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Think about it. Demas, a member of Paul's ministry team, who at one time was a devoted, faithful follower of Jesus Christ and helper with Paul, now has gotten to a point in his Christian life where he loves the world more than he loves Jesus and where he's willing to walk away from his calling on his life. Folks, that's why we need to be devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Because there's a lot of examples of Demas in the body of Christ. People who don't finish strong. People who don't stick with it. People who don't sustain it over the long haul. And young people and old people and everyone in between need to see examples of people who stick with it and sustain it and maintain it over the long haul. You know, don't just start well, but who finish well. With that in mind, keep reading along with me. He says, give my greetings to the brothers and sisters who are in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church that meets in her house. And after you've read this letter, have it read to the church of Laodicea in turn and read the letter from Laodicea as well. They were to switch these letters and read them to the assembly. Then notice, and tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. See to it. Stay focused, Archippus. Don't get distracted. Complete the ministry. Carry it through to the end. Finish strong. Paul finished strong. Remember those words at the end of 2 Timothy 4? I finished the course. I kept the faith. Paul's encouraging every Christian to be that way. Be devoted. Because it is out of our devotion to those certain things in our life that we need to be devoted to that will allow us to finish strong and cross the finish line of our life victorious rather than being like Demas, who something along life's way distracted and all of a sudden he got enamored by something else other than Jesus Christ alone. And he left. He says, this ministry you have received in the Lord. Do your part, he's saying to Archippus. Every one of us has a part in the body of Christ. And for the body to truly be as strong and functioning at full strength and at full capacity like it needs to be, everyone needs to be doing their part. Read Ephesians chapter 4. Paul talks to the church and every member in the church about that. He says, the church can't be functioning at full strength and full capacity unless every member of that body is doing its part. Guess what? That means devotion. That means to being at our post and being consistently, constantly, continuously at our post. Reliable, dependable, on and on we could go. And we're going to talk more about that in just a moment. And then Paul leaves them, I think, with his own example an example that he wants to inspire them, to stir them to finish strong and to be devoted followers of Jesus Christ. When in verse 18, 
He says, I, Paul, write this greeting by my own hand. Remember my chains, Paul says to them. Be mindful of what I have as a Christian been willing to go through in my life and let my example, my devotion to the Lord, my faithfulness to God inspire you, motivate you, and stir you, Paul says. Grace be with you. I want to go back now to this concept of devotion. The very first thing that Paul said in relationship, yes, into the context of prayer. And I want us to keep it there. But I also want to just step back and expand it a little bit this morning. Because this concept is so vitally important to our Christian faith. What does it mean to be devoted? It means to do something constantly, consistently, continuously. That God has called us to be or to do despite or in spite of the difficulty, the adversity, and the resistance. With a persistent, prevailing strength. That's what it means to be devoted. In other words, the implication by even using the word is that we have to be devoted to certain things in our life or else we won't do them. Because there will inherently be, connected with those things, pushback, resistance. And unless you and I are willing through God to develop a devoted heart, a devoted mindset, a devoted lifestyle to certain things, then we won't ever carry them through. We won't ever see them through. Because all of a sudden we'll get pushback, we'll get adversity, we'll get pressure from the other side, whether it's our spiritual enemy, who will be constantly trying to to push back against us and, and make it hard for us. And that's why James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Are we able to resist him because of our and out of our devotion to the things that God calls us to do and to be? And then there's our own flesh. I mean, there's many times in our Christian life where our own human fallen flesh just says, nah, I want to take care of my flesh today. I don't, I don't feel like doing that. And what Paul is saying to all of us here, and what's so essential to our faith, is that we move past the whole feeling thing and walk by faith, which is what the Bible tells us we must do. The just shall live by faith. You never see in the Bible where it says, Christians, be led by your feelings. Because guess what? Let me say this. When you and I don't feel like praying is when we need to pray the most. When you and I don't feel like reading our Bible and getting into it and studying it is when we need to get into it the most. When you and I don't feel like worshiping God, that's when we need to worship Him the most. When you and I don't feel like being in church or going to church is when we need to be in church and go to church the most. The problem is today, because of the lack of devotion in many churches and in many Christians' lives, if it doesn't fall into place and it's not convenient and I don't feel like it, there's no push. They get a little resistance. And, and can I just say this as a pastor, especially zeroing in with church? I don't know whether you know this yet or not, but especially your spiritual enemy will always always make it harder and more difficult for you to come out to Bible study on Tuesday night and church on Sunday. I mean, that's just, mark it down. If you, haven't, if you haven't put those together yet, of why is it that when I, you know, try to get up and get to churches, but there's all these things? Because again, that's the pushback. And unless you and I as Christians are willing to say, you know what, devil? You, you know what, flesh? Whatever you throw against me, I'm doing this because I know I need to. And can I just say, I think all of us would give testimony to the fact that as Christians, when you and I finally show up somewhere where we know it's been a battle to get there, and maybe we didn't even feel like going that day, did not God bless you when you did? 
Did you not get like an extra blessing when you pushed through and prayed even though you didn't feel like praying? Or you pushed through and opened your Bible even though you didn't feel like it? Or you pushed through and worshiped and spent time in praise and you didn't really want to? And that's why God is saying, look, there's going to be lots of times where you don't feel like it. That's when you and I need to do it the most. That's devotion. There will always be resistance. And really what Paul's talking about when he talks about devotion is what I call spiritual resistance training. Years ago, they found out in the physical world, you know what, if people exercise with some resistance, it helps them to build up mass, tone, muscle, strength, endurance. All kinds of positive things happen when there's resistance against us when we're exercising. We actually get more benefit long term out of having resistance. Well, guess what? Same principle applies in the spiritual world. If you and I are willing through God to build up that strength that we've talked about in previous weeks and truly be devoted to what God calls us to do and to be that in spite of the resistance it's going to come against us again whether it's through our spiritual enemy or our flesh or the world or whatever and all the distractions out there if we just push through and push back against that resistance over and over again we become stronger we build up spiritual endurance we build up spiritual stamina to where it takes more and more and more for us to give in or give up be devoted Paul says I want you to turn with me back to the book of Acts to Acts chapter 2 for a moment I get asked this question frequently. I know other Christians converse about this. And here, here's where it comes around to. Why, Jeff, does the church today, why is it not making the impact? Why is it not influencing the world? Why are we not turning the world upside down like the early church did? And can I share with you today what I think is the main reason why we're not changing the world as the church today like they did back in the book of Acts? Ten times in the New Testament, this word that we saw in Colossians 4.2 is used. The word for devotion, the word that's translated devote, devoted or devotion in the New Testament. Over half of those times that this word is used, it's used in the book of Acts. And notice in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, these words. What was the early church doing? Why were they being used of God and turning the world upside down and making such an impact and influencing their world? Because the Bible says they were devoting themselves to certain things. It didn't matter what the resistance or the pushback was. They continued... They were continuously giving themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and oh, by the way, bring us back to Colossians 4, to prayer. Devoted to it. God wants to create and build a group of devoted followers. Because we will have adversity. We will have winds coming against us as we seek to make progress spiritually. And as we seek to discipline our lives and be consistent in what I call the spiritual disciplines. Prayer, the Word of God, our interaction with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And what the Bible tells us is, look guys, there's always going to be something in our lives that tries to get us from worshiping, from praying, from being in the Word, 
from being with one another. And unless we develop a devotion like the early church had that said, I don't care what happens, this is what we're doing. And think about the resistance they had. They were meeting in the very place where Jesus had been crucified. You, you think Christianity wasn't popular today or isn't popular today. What do you think they were dealing with? And these were people who lost relationships and friendships and partnerships and everything because of their embracing of Jesus Christ. And yet it didn't matter what was coming against them. There was such an internal spiritual strength that God had developed in them that they basically said, this is what we're doing and we don't care what comes against us. Folks, that's the kind of group of Christians and individual Christians that God wants to build. That's the kind of people Jesus talks about when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't even prevail against it. Because there will be such a persistent prevailing strength from my people that no matter what is thrown against them, they will continue to march forward in my name, in my power, and they won't let other things push them away to where they give up and give in so easily. They will develop a devotion. Can I say too, that's one of the reasons why in every strata of our society, you don't see many long-lasting, long-sustainable relationships. Because there's not much devotion to each other anymore. From husband-wife, all the way on down through all of our society, there's no devotion Yes, there's going to be hard times. Yes, there's going to be all kinds of things thrown at us. There's going to be resistance. There's going to be yuck. Our flesh is going to, to fight against us. Uh, the enemy is going to fight against us. But in order for us to prevail and get through all of the difficulties and, and adverse winds and all of that, we've got to be devoted and maintain devotion, Paul says or else we will go the way of Demas, who at one time was a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And then Paul very sadly says, he deserted me because he loved this present world. What a sad commentary on a life. God wants us to finish strong. And God wants to use us as a church and as individuals to make a positive impact and influence, not only on our brothers and sisters in Christ, because we desperately need to do that, but on the world out there that doesn't know Christ. They desperately need to see Jesus in us. And the only way others are going to consistently see Jesus in us is when you and I allow ourselves to develop devotion to where people say they're devoted. It doesn't matter what comes against them. Man, they're there. I'm going to ask our worship team to come up on stage. And I know while people are moving around, it's hard to stay connected and stay concentrating, but please hang in there with me while they're moving, because I asked them to do this. We don't give an invitation every Sunday at the Oasis, but I really felt impressed today, based upon this message, to do so. And I just want to ask, as we sing this last song, that maybe some of you would say, God, you spoke to me today. And maybe it's not even generally about, just generally, I, I, I need to just sort of recommit myself to being a devoted follower of yours or letting you make me a devoted follower. Maybe there's a specific area. Because a lot of times that's how the Holy Spirit works. 
In other words, he takes a sort of a general message like this and then he zeroes it in to where it's, it's just for us. Where he might speak to us and say like, Jeff, you need to be more devoted to that thing called prayer. Or maybe it's, Jeff, you, you need to be more devoted in your worship, in your time in the Word. You need to be more devoted to your brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever that is. But that God may be specifically shaping this message just for where we all are. And listen, I realize that if I was to say, hey, you know, we, th th this, this is for all of us who want to be more devoted, probably all of us, well, yeah, I, I, I need to be more devoted. I get that. But sometimes God is speaking to us in just such a clear, strong way that sometimes the best way to respond isn't by just you and God, but, but sometimes it's by sort of, again, making it public and, and, and making sort of that commitment to get up out of that chair and to walk down here and to just say, okay, God, I... This is a, a nail that I'm driving into that board. This is a stake that I'm driving into that ground. Do whatever you need to do in my life to bring about the devotion that I need to have in my life because the world needs to see Jesus in me. My brothers and sisters in Christ need to see Jesus in me. And God, I want, I want to be a devoted follower of yours. So whatever God you have to do in my life, you do it. Because I want you to take my life and be used for your glory and your kingdom. Let's stand, please. And as we sing, those of you that want to come here and just do business with God, you come as we sing. And others of you that you're on our prayer team and prayer ministry or you just love to pray, you see somebody down here and you want to come down and just maybe even say, hey, we, would you like me to pray with you or pray for you? I, I would invite you to do that this morning as well because isn't that what Colossians 4 was all about? This picture of this guy, Epaphras, who entered the arena every day praying for his brothers and sisters in Christ, agonizing over their spiritual growth and maturity. Wow, what an example to all of us. May we pray for one another as much as we pray for ourselves. So God, take our life today. Make it yours. Use it for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.